News of the Times. Serial Killer Saturdays. The Inn of Death. Welcome to News of the Times. Before we actually start the story, I'd just like to say some members of this team absolutely love finding 150-year-old French stories. And some of the stories are great. But they have great jollity in getting me to try and pronounce 150-year-old French. And it's not my strongest suit. So please, bear with me. Today's episode from 1833 could easily have been the real live inspiration for the notorious Sweeney Todd episodes, which first made an appearance in an 1846 Penny Dreadful issue. Although Sweeney Todd was fictional, the Red Inn, located in the remote hills of the Ardèche, was not. Tales spoke of a death trap located in the hills, where travellers were plundered in their sleep, killed and dismembered, with the remaining body parts being made use in stews and pâtés. This shocking set of crimes from France has become legend and has inspired many a horror story writer of the past. We take a look at the Martin family, their remote inn and the tales surrounding this death trap in today's episode of Serial Killer Saturdays. Before we start the show, we would be very grateful if you would consider liking and subscribing to our channel. Help us build a brilliant community by subscribing or liking and sharing our videos. We're on this incredible journey together. Thank you. Now back to the ghoulish tale of the Red Inn in 1833. We hope you enjoy the show. The Red Inn enigma emerged as a notorious incident in the 19th century wherein a lodger was discovered lifeless with grievously fractured skull. Suspicion loomed over the innkeepers, Pierre and Marie Martin, along with their servant, Jean Rochette. The subsequent legal proceedings, often referred to as the crimes of Peribaye, as the inn was known at the time, or the trial of the four monsters, unfolded as a sensational affair. Alongside the murder charges, the Martins and Rochette found themselves accused of the grotesque crime of cannibalism. This notorious series of murders was said to have occurred over 25 years, from 1803 to 1831. The Background the Martins took charge of the Red Inn, formerly known Le Auberge de Peribaye, in 1805, nestled in the southern French commune of Lanarp in the Ardèche. It stood on the periphery of Isanlas and La Villatte, isolated among a desolate thoroughfare. Pierre Martin once a humble farmer and his wife Marie, undertook an impressive ascent from poverty. It was rumoured that the Martins had amassed the considerable fortune of 30,000 gold francs, worth approximately £10 million in 2023. But this figure was likely inflated gossip from jealous neighbours. Certainly, the Martins were comparatively wealthy as compared to others in the area. The papers were less than kind in their descriptions of the Martins and Rochette. From the London Courier and Evening Gazette, the 26th of December, 1833, discovery of a gang of robbers and assassins. The French journals of the month mentioned the execution of two persons, man and wife, named Martin, and of a servant of theirs named Rochette. It would seem that this Martin and his wife, who kept a public house or inn, 
were in the habit for twenty-five years of murdering and robbing those who took up their lodgings. The house was in a lonely place, and built, it is said, for the very purpose of murder and robbery. It was contrived that if once a person got in, there was no possibility of escape. Long impunity made them so bold that they hardly took any trouble to conceal their crimes, and the country around them was silent on the subject either through bribery or fear. Martin was a man of sinister and atrocious countenance, about sixty years old at the time of his trial. His father is said to have been hanged for assassination, and one of his brothers condemned to the gallows. The wife was fifty-four, hideous in aspect, and said to resemble the infamous Bancal. Jean Rochette, the servant, aged forty-seven, had all the appearance of a ruffian. A nephew, also named André Martin, was put upon his trial at the same time. They all appeared at the bar dressed after the manner of the mountaineers of Ardèche. The Martins were not popular with their neighbours. With the money they had, they were able to enforce their wishes in the area. Retrospectively, neighbours spoke of their fear of crossing the Martin. The Crime On the 12th of October, 1831, a horse-dealer, Antoine Enjolras, on the search for a missing heifer he owned, stopped and lodged at the remote inn. He was never seen again alive. Investigations ensued which led the magistrates to the Red Inn. Enjolras's body was found shortly afterwards a few hundred feet from the inn. His skull had been smashed in, and all of his personal goods were missing. Pierre Martin and his nephew André Martin and the servant Rochette were arrested forthwith, followed a few days later by Marie Martin, an unusual arrest as it was considered improbable at the time that a woman could be a murderess. Whilst under arrest, investigations ensued with inquiries being asked of the previously fearful neighbours. What came out was a series of wild testimony regarding the Martins and their inn. It was stated that the bodies would be cooked in the bread oven, often giving off a foul-smelling stench to the area. That some bodies would be dismembered with body parts being used in stews and fed to other visitors of the inn that some body parts would be used in pâtés, yet other travellers would be dumped in the snow with the appearance that they had frozen to death. Travellers in general finding themselves in that remote inn were likely to be robbed and then killed, however their corpse ended up. The Trial The Trial of the Four Monsters as the three Martins and Rochette were called, took place on the 18th of June, 1833. The investigation had been exhaustive. The prosecution gathered 109 witnesses, although it was thought that the couple had killed over 50 travellers in their 25-year history, the whole of their guilt would be decided on the case of the missing horse trader, Antoine Enjolras. Many witnesses testified to having seen body parts, such as dismembered hands, cooking in stews, whilst others testified to blood-splattered walls and foul stenches from burning flesh pumping out of their chimney. Witnesses were also brought forward to recount their own talks or near escapes from death. From the London Courier and Evening Gazette, the 26th of the December, 1833, 
discovery of a gang of robbers and assassins. The three Martins and Rochette were tried for the murder of Antoine Enjolras, who disappeared on the 12th of October 1831, and whose mutilated body was found on the banks of the Allier. There were 109 witnesses examined. Vincent Boyer, one of the witnesses, deposed to the following facts. One day in the winter of 1824, I was forced by the severity of the weather to stop at Martin's house, a place called Peyrabel. There were many persons there, and among the rest an old man. Martin's wife asked me to draw near the fire and inquired how much I earned and what money I had with me. She said there was a band of brigands in the neighbourhood and asked what I should do if they attacked me and whether I was a heavy sleeper. I told her I had thirty sous about me and that I slept very soundly. I was frightened at these questions, and it occurred to me that I was in a slaughterhouse. She then put questions to the old man, who said that he was after selling a cow. When bedtime arrived, the people of the house told us in, in an imperative tone to go to our rooms and no longer concealed their object. The old man saw his danger and said he would sleep in the same room with me, but they told him very dryly that he must sleep alone. When the old man got to his room, he made some objections, and I heard a voice say, Do as you like. There's no other room for you. I heard his door shut, and the person who conducted him returned downstairs. One of Martin's daughters accompanied me to my room and told me not to leave the door open in a tone of command. When she departed, I examined the bed and found large spots of blood on the sheets. I lay down, more dead than alive, and in about an hour after some person came in to see if I was asleep, turned over my clothes, and finding that I only had only thirty sous, did not take them, but went away. Two or three hours after, I heard knocking on the old man's door. Get up, they said, it is time, but no answer. Those who made this noise went down to the ground floor and came up again in half an hour. They knocked again, calling out as before. Receiving no answer, they forced open the door, and I immediately heard three times distinctly a cry of, Help! Help! and then only heard inarticulate sounds like those of a pig when the knife is at its throat. During all this time, the daughters of Martin, aged from twenty-five to thirty, were at my door as if to watch me, singing and laughing. In the morning, Martin's wife asked me if I slept well and whether I heard anything. I said I never woke the whole night. I was so terrified that when I got a little from the house, I ran as fast as I could and never stopped till I found myself out of danger. The cross-examination did not shake any part of this evidence. The only difficulty was how he could have been induced to keep it secret so long and whether it arose from fear or indifference. His testimony produced an extraordinary sensation in court and upon the accused. Their only defence was a simple denial, and their counsel was silent. The Witness of the Killing The prosecution had managed to track down a witness from the night of the killing of Enjolras. The witness was a pauper who got his living from begging. From the London Courier and Evening Gazette, the 26th of December, 1833. Discovery of a gang of robbers and assassins. Laurent Chase, a mendicant, aged 56, 
gave the following evidence. Two years back, returning from a journey to Louvre, I passed by Puy. On the evening of the event, I was taken in a car by a man who I had met part of the way to Peyrabelle. I arrived after nightfall at Martin's house and asked for lodging. Martin's wife told me to go elsewhere, as they had no lodging for me. I told her if she would let me sleep in the hayloft, I would pay for that and any other accommodation. Martin said, Will you sleep on the hay? Yes, said I, or wherever you put me. I went in and saw four persons around the fire, and together with Marie Armand, there were also three men sitting at a table. One of these three men said he lost a heifer in returning from the fair at saint cirque and that he meant to sleep that night with his friend Martin. That man who thus spoke to me was, I have since found out, was N. Jolras. The other two men went away, Martin's wife refusing to give them any more to drink. I went to sleep in the hayloft, and Enjolras was within six or eight paces of me. A few moments after getting on the loft, the male prisoners, Pierre and André Martin, came up the ladder to the place where Enjolras was, followed by the woman Martin, bearing a lamp and pitcher in her hand, both of which she gave to the men and returned down. I pretended to be asleep, at the same time watching the movements of the men. They threw themselves on Enjolras, saying, You must drink this, and instantly I heard a noise as if a man were struck on the head with a hammer. I then heard doleful sounds of, Oh! 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 Two of the men drew near and looked at me, and I thought I heard them say, He's asleep. The three men took up his body between them and conveyed it from the loft. I heard one say, Hold fast, don't let it fall. When they got down to the kitchen, which is under the hayloft, I heard them say, We have made one hundred crowns this night. They came up again and seemed to survey me with great attention. They came up this way two or three times, and I heard them again in the kitchen saying that they had not got very much. I rose at daylight, the servant being the only person in the loft. I thanked them for their kindness and offered to pay for lodging. They said they never charged for a bed on the hay, and they asked if I slept soundly, and I said yes. I left the house and mentioned some of the circumstances, but not the whole, to persons who I met on the way to Nice. This witness was cross-examined for three hours, but no contradiction was drawn from him. Being confronted with Marie Armand, he persisted in saying that she was in Martin's house on the day he arrived there, the day of the killing. The witness, Marie Armand, a local of the area, was to be a key prosecution witness who would confirm the beggar's story. She was reticent, whether from fear or because she actually did not see anything, is unclear. From the London Courier and Evening Gazette, 26th of December, 1833, Discovery of a Gang of Robbers and Assassins. Many of the witnesses, under the influence either of bribe or menace, contradicted or greatly qualified their previous testimony. Nothing important could be elicited from Marie Armand, although it is certain she passed the night of Enjolras's murder at Martin's. That she did so was admitted by two other witnesses who passed the same night in the house, but who also gave their evidence with great reluctance. Whatever might have been her motive, 
whether friendship or fear, she withdrew from the neighbourhood for a long time and to avoid appearing as a witness. On the trial, she said she slept at home on the night of the murder and denied all knowledge of it. Of the witnesses who swore to her being in the house, she asked, It would appear that these people have two souls, of which they can afford to damn one. I know I have but one, and will not damn but save it. She named many persons, she said, who could prove she slept at home that fateful night. They were summoned, but not one appeared to prove her alibi. This was her conduct on the first day of trial. On the second day, however, she avowed that she gave her former evidence under the influence of terror. She confirmed that she was at Martin's the night of the murder, that a man came there who said he had lost a heifer, and that he took supper and went to sleep on the hayloft. A full disclosure was expected when she came to this point, but no effort could draw a word more from her. Although importuned by the public prosecutor, the judge and the jury, she persisted in saying that she heard no cries from the hayloft, although she slept in the kitchen under it, and denied all knowledge of the murder. She acknowledged, however, that she saw the cart arrive at the house and going to sleep on the lot. Despite Marie Armand's reluctance to commit to having seen or heard the murder, her confirmation regarding seeing a cart arrive at the house confirmed other testimony which stated that the body was seen to have been thrown into a cart and dumped a few kilometres away. The trial lasted seven days. During the first four days, the prisoners showed great confidence and laughed at the most appalling parts of the evidence. Their manner greatly altered towards the close of the trial, as they realised that the evidence was against them. Possibly the most damaging of all was Rochette's own solicitor, who confirmed that his client, Rochette, was a murderer, but that it was not his fault. He had been forced into the activities by the Martins. Pierre Martin, Marie Martin, and their servant, Rochette, were found guilty of the murder of Enjolras, their nephew, André Martin, was acquitted and discharged. On October the 2nd, 1833, the three were guillotined outside of their death inn. Report stated that there were over 30,000 spectators to watch their doom. A bloody X was placed on a large stone to mark the spot. Legend has it that a dance took place on the same forecourt that very night to celebrate the death of the Martins. Sixty years later, the horrific series of murders from the Red Inn were brought up again as the inn was up for sale at the bargain price of 100 francs, which is about approximately 15,000 pounds in 2023. From the Star, the 8th of June, 1893, Notorious Inn for Sale. The Notorious Wayside Inn at Peyrebel, which during a period of 26 years was the scene of innumerable murders of travellers, is for sale. This former death trap is situated in a wild spot among the Ardèche Mountains. At the time of the murders, it was kept by a man and his wife, assisted by a servant. The crimes of the trio were eventually discovered, and they all perished on a scaffold erected in front of the inn. But the exact number of travellers they had killed was never found out. The price asked is only 100 francs, 
a thousand times less, perhaps, than had been made by the many authors who have exploited the horrible legend of Pei Rabel. That concludes this episode of Serial Killer Saturdays, The Inn of Death. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy this show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel. We are passionate about historical crime and do our best to present interesting cases from long ago that go beyond the usual fare. For our listeners and subscribers, thank you. We so very much appreciate the many supporters and subscribers who have helped us to build this channel. The News of the Times team all appreciate each of you for your help. We upload four days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time spans of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Mondays are murderous where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Wednesdays are wicked where we pull together stories of a similar theme such as stories of murders by starvation. And Fridays are frightful, with stories that are grouped by geographic location, allowing us to share lesser-known grisly crime stories. From all of us at the News of the Times team, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.